Okay, this looks good. Uh, let me just one thing. Okay. Hi, you guys. So my name is Gabe Hollenby. Uh, I am relatively new to Python, so I just want to start out by saying I'm probably going to say something that's wrong, and if I do, let me know, because that's how we all learn, and I will appreciate that. Uh, a little bit about my background before I get going. Uh, I come from primarily a Ruby and JavaScript background, and I recent, I'm, I'm a consultant here in Singapore. I recently rolled off a six-month Python project, and uh, TDD is a test-driven development. It's a big part of what I do and how I work, and I needed to do, I needed to bring TDD to this project that we were going to work on. So the engineers knew Python, they didn't do a lot of testing, I know testing, I didn't know a lot of Python, so it was kind of a nice marriage in that I got to learn the language and uh, take a survey about what sorts of testing tools were out there and available, uh, and what I've distilled here is a result of uh, those six months. So my tips for if you're new to testing uh, in general, this you'll probably learn something if you already are doing TDD, but you're not using PyTest, you'll probably find something here you like. If you already use PyTest and you're really comfortable you know, with uh, void space mock, you're probably not going to learn anything, but maybe you'll just enjoy the sound of my voice. <laughs> so that, let's get started. Uh, so PyTest is a testing framework for Python. Uh, you don't need to use PyTest to do test-driven development in Python. Uh, you know, you've got a unit test built in, uh, but PyTest has a lot of features that you might be interested in. Uh, the way I found out about it was uh, Cloudera. They do a lot of you know, Hadoop open source stuff, and they have a popular uh, tool for doing SQL on Hadoop called Impala. And Impala has a big Python component, and they used PyTest. So the project I was on was using Impala. I discovered PyTest through that, and I was like, oh, then I found out that a lot of people use PyTest because it gives you a lot of nice things. So why PyTest? Uh, it's concise. Uh, it gives you helpful assertion messages. Uh, there's this concept called fixtures, which instead of your normal X unit sort of setup, teardown stuff, there's a different way that uses dependency injection to make your tests more readable. If, you, if that sounds scary to you, don't worry, I'll explain it. It won't be scary. You'll think it's cool. PyTest is popular, uh, and there's a ton of plugins. So that's kind of, this is what I'm going to cover uh, probably in the next 20 minutes, I hope. So from PyTest's homepage, this is sort of like the, the bullet points about why PyTest. So uh, I, don't, I hope you can read it in the back. But yeah, it kind of runs everywhere. Uh, it's got a lot of tests, right? The testing framework, of course, is tested itself. Uh, I like that they have a strict backward compatibility. Compatibility policy, of course, that's kind of the norm in the Python community, which I like, but uh, it's nice that that's there. They have really great documentation, a lot. In fact, I would almost say so much that it's hard to figure it all out at first. Uh, after this talk, you'll understand enough of the basics that if you go and you look at the documentation, you'll have an easier time navigating it. But there's a lot of it, which is good. Right, there's lots of plugins, uh, a lot of people use it, and of course there's a lot of examples. So how do you install it? That's easy. You just do pip install if you use pip, or I suppose you can easy install it too, but from what I've heard, you're supposed to use pip, so I use pip to install it. And pytest, uh, so the weird thing is, it's called pytest, pytest, no dot, right? But the binary it installs is pi.test. So when you're invoking it on the command line, you're gonna type pi.test, but the egg is called PyTest, no dot. So just remember that. So our first test, this is just going to come straight off of the uh, PyTest examples on their website. Can you guys read that OK in the back? Awesome. Uh, right, so we have a function, takes uh, some x in and adds one to it. Uh, and we have a, another uh, method here called test answer. Uh, I guess it's a function because it's not in the class, but anyway. Uh, it starts with test underscore. It can have anything after that. PyTest will automatically discover anything that has test underscore as a, as a function or method name, uh, and it'll run it. So this is just a simple assert, right? It says assert, just the keyword assert, and some function invocation equals some value. Uh, obviously, this won't work, but uh, if you were to write this in something like uh, test unit, uh, it's uh, or unit test rather, it's like assert equals, you know, thing comma thing. 
that's cool, but what's nice about PyTest is you kind of only really need to remember assert. And a lot of the common things you're going to want to assert, you can just assert with an expression and it'll make sense. So that, that'll become more clear in a minute. What does it look like when you run this? So uh, if you just say PyTest, uh, it's going to find any files in its, currently, in its current directory uh, that you run this command in. It'll look through those files for your methods that have test underscore and it'll run those. That's the simplest invocation. It actually can do a little bit more things for you, but uh, it's going to be hard for you to read in the back. I have a zoom in of this in a moment, but you kind of get this kind of output. This is the default output. Let's zoom in. So by default, what it says is, right, I ran this test and uh, obviously there was an assertion error, but it tries to be even more helpful and say, okay, so this is a line that failed and here were the values that were actually there, right? And so uh, it, it tries to, it, of course, this is like what line number in the test, the, uh, the or what line number in the file that it ran caused the failing test. So everything you need is there. And it, by default, it, it's quite verbose. Uh, you, there are different output styles you can tell PyTest to do. Uh, you can tell it to do the native Python uh, exception traces. You can do one line per failure, and there's like a, a middle ground between this and that called short. That, is gives you a little bit of context, but doesn't bloat your scroll back with way too much helpful stuff. So uh, before we go on, that's the easiest thing to do is to test if something equals something else or not. But you, of course, you can also test exceptions really easily. So uh, this is very not quite nice. Um, if you want to test does something raise an exception, the easiest way is to use this context manager. And so within the duration of this, right? So with pytest.raises, give it the exception you're interested in seeing if it will raise or not, make your thing raise the thing, and this test will pass, right? And so it'll just say, all right, everything's happy. I expected it to raise, and it did. But one of the really neat things about PyTest is the context-sensitive comparisons. The documentation goes into this a little bit, uh, and they kind of encourage you to just go look at the source for more. Here are my favorite examples. So you can do set assertions, uh, and it's going to be really helpful, right? So assert this set equals this other set. Uh, and I put it on three lines just so that it would read nicely. Obviously, you wouldn't normally put on three lines, probably. Uh, but look, right? Extra items in the left set, one. Extra items in the right set, five. That's super helpful. It doesn't just go, yeah, those two things, they weren't equal. So that's nice. Of course, for string equality, it tries to be even more helpful. And if the strings are almost the same but a little bit different, you don't have to go figure out why. It puts a little carrot. It shows you exactly where they're different. Um, that works for multi-line strings, too out of the box. So if you've got, you know, foo spam bar and foo eggs bar, it'll tell you right. Well, they both have food bar, but there's the diff of what was different between those two. It even does really, really long string differences. So this is sort of a contrived example, but if we have uh, a string A that's 100 ones, and then an A, and then 100 twos, and string B is 100 ones, and then a B, and then 100 twos, uh, we're trying to assume that they're equal, it's going to say, right, okay, I did the assertion, for those of you in the back, it says, skipping 90 identical leading characters in diff, use dash v to show if you do want to see them all, and then it says, blah, 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 skipping this one, skipping 91 ident ident identical trailing characters, it tells you how many identical leading, how many identical trailing, and then it kind of zooms into the part that's actually different and gives you the same little carrot. It's really sweet. Like, they, right, these, the people who make PyTest have thought a lot about making your life easier. And again, this is all just with assert, right? We don't need to, it's not like assert, multi-line happens to be equal, and assert super long lines are, are equal, but show me the helpful part. No, just assert. Uh, and within your dictionary, so this is quite nice too. It's sort of an elaboration on the set one. So there's one identical item, but uh, different items, right? B. Uh, the, the key B exists in both, uh, it's one and one and two and the other. Left contains C, right contains D. So again, very helpful. Uh, so context sensitive assertions. <clears throat> Next up, we've got uh, classic X unit setup and teardown. So if you come from a, like classic TDD, you think, okay, right, you're gonna give me a class and inside that class called test something or other, I'm gonna have a method called setup and I'm gonna have a bunch of methods called test something, test something else, test something other, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna have a method called teardown. And what it'll do is it'll run my setup method uh, first, uh, and then it'll, you know, probably, usually you can decide, right? Like, do I want it to run once before everything, or do I want it to run once before each of my test methods inside that class? <coughs> so, this is really, it's gonna be torque for you guys reading the back, but what's going on here is, uh, 
PyTest supports that out of the box. You, this is not the PyTest way, but if you, if you want to use PyTest uh, with the, this sort of classic X unit style, you can. So you've got setup module, teardown module. Those are going to happen at the beginning and end of whatever mod for each module file that PyTest finds and decides to run on. Then you've got inside some class, you can have class methods, so have setup class and teardown class. That's going to run once for the class. But then you've got setup method, teardown method. That's going to run once for each method. And then inside here, I just have two tests, test one, test two. Uh, what this looks like if it runs uh, is this, I just made an example that kind of showed you the nesting of it all, right? So there's only one module here, there's only one class. Setup method got run once, test one, then tear down one. Then setup method got run again, test two, then it te that got tear down, then tear down the class and module. Okay. But PyTest doesn't want you to do it this way. PyTest wants you to use this thing called fixtures. And here's what PyTest has to say about fixtures. Purpose of fixtures is to run a fixed baseline upon which tests can reliably and repeatedly execute. That doesn't seem like the best way to sell them to me, but uh, they also say fixtures have explicit names and are activated by declaring their use in form, in, from test functions, modules, classes, or whole projects. This, this sentence here about you know, activated by declaring their use, that's dependency injection, right? Uh, if, you, if you don't know what that is, this will make sense in a minute. If you use Angular, you know, super popular in Angular, you already get this. So we have a... Uh, a class called person, he's got a method on him called greet. Uh, he doesn't do anything, but because uh, I, I guess I want this test to fail, right? So what I can do though is I can say, I've got a method called person. I'm going to use this, uh, is it decorators in Python or annotations? Decorators. I'm going to use a decorator here and say, right, this, this function should be considered a fixture PyTest. When you, when you run, you're going to see this and know that this guy, if I pass him as a parameter into any of my test functions, I want you to run it and insert the result in there. Does that make sense? So you're, what PyTest wants you to do is not use the setup and teardown stuff, but instead declare the whole world of your test, everything your test depends on, right here in the method. And that's super nice because you don't have like all this like nested invocations and stuff. You know, right, I've got a person. That's all I need to think about for running this test. And you don't have to scroll back up, you know, 50 lines to, to see what, what was that set up for, the, for this test. So, right, I'll, uh, I'll look at the result from person.greet and I'll assert that they're the same. Uh, and, uh, ah, so this is actually a bug in my test. I should have said something like high game or hello game. Anyway, the point is it'll fail, assuming that greet was actually implemented. Um, so this is just an example of showing that it fails. So how did this work, right? So again, PyTest sees that test greet needs a function argument named person, and it saw, oh right, there's a matching fixture called person, so I'm going to run that, fi that fixture function, I'm going to take the result, I'm going to pass it in to the scope of that test when it executes. So fixtures are awesome. Uh, a few reasons why. They can call other fixtures, so you can have, you know, because a fixture is just a function too, and, and PyTest will say, oh, this function wanted person, but person wanted favorite food, uh, you know, or you know, buffet or something, and it can it can crawl up the chain of you know dependencies that need to get injected. It'll run them all in the right order. Um, you can also use fixtures to do parameterized function testing. I'll talk about that more later in a way that doesn't actually use fixtures, but suffice to say that if if, if you want to say uh, this fixture is going to generate a bunch of different data, and I want each of these results that this fixture generates to be passed one at a time against this function. You can kind of do things like that. Um, right, you can share them between test files even. So if it's super, uh, you can do it with an import, but if it's, if it's something you don't want to import everywhere, there, PyTest has this file called conftest.py that it'll look for and kind of boot into its environment before it runs. If you have a fixture that you use everywhere and you don't want to declare it in all of your, in your test methods, uh, you can say auto use true as part of the decorator, and that's, you know, of course, don't abuse that, but there's a, there's a time and a place where you're like, right, all the tests inside this file are going to use this mocked something or other, and I don't want to have to inject it into all of my tests. Auto use true, and I'm good. So that'll do the setup and tear down implicitly. Uh, and of course, you can even test your fixtures because they're just functions. So you can even write tests against the fixtures if you, if you want some extra certainty about, oh, I'm not really sure if this fixture is doing what I'm thinking it's doing, or better yet, the fixture is really complicated, but you have a lot of tests that depend on it. Why don't you write a quick unit test for your fixture, and then you can refactor the fixture and be confident that you're not going to break all your tests because 
you brought tests for your fixture. Okay, so that's kind of it about the basics about PyTest, and now I want to get into a little bit about mocking. So how do we verify calls? Right? This is another thing we need to do in TDD all the time. Uh, or if you're doing test app, it just, the driven part doesn't make sense. Uh, in testing, we, we want to verify uh, that things are getting called. So imagine we have a class called DB. Uh, he's got a persist method. And imagine we have a class called person, and uh, when we construct it, we pass in a name and an instance of this DB. And when we call save on the person, we expect that person to call persist on its DB, passing himself in. It's a contrived example, but I think it kind of makes sense. How do we test this? So uh, I want you to use mock. Mock, from what I understand, is part of Python 3. Is that right? Yeah? Uh, if, it, if you're not using Python 3, I wasn't for this project I was working on. I was using 2.6 even, if you can believe that. Uh, void space dot co dot uk slash mock, I think is the URL. Um, just if you look Google for like Python mock void space, this, this is the one you should use. Part of Python 3, and you can use it in two. So uh, from mock, import mock, capital M, and uh, from my example file, I'm going to import my person in DB class. So I'm going to make a fixture called mock db, and that is just going to return me a mock, and I'm going to say, hey mock, I want you to I'm, I want you to spec yourself like this DB class. And so that becomes like a verifying mock. That'll say, okay, I'm going to record how I'm interacted with this object, right? It's not really a DB. It's this thing that's going to have all of the same function signatures as a DB, but they're not going to return anything by default. It's a fake implementation. But if I call a method on this mock that's not in my DB, this mock instance will say, yo, I'm not supposed to, you're interacting with me in a way that I'm not even supposed to handle. So maybe you're doing something you don't want. It's usually a good idea. You don't have to. You could just say mock with nothing. And then you have basically like a null object or a ghost object where you can call foo.bar.baz doesn't matter on this mock. And it'll remember, right, foo was called and you know, foo.bar was called and all that stuff. But generally speaking, I would advise to spec your mocks when possible. So that's the setup. That's our fixture. Here's our test. So test safe persist to DB. I'm injecting my mock DB fixture in there. So I'm going to make a person, and I'm going to pass that mock DB into my person, right? Because that's how I constructed my person. I'm going to call save, and then I'm going to say, OK, hey, mock DB, uh, your persist method. Please assert that you are called with gig. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, and that'll pass. So there's no point in me showing you passing test output because it'll just look like a dot, and it'll say test pass. But let's look at a failing test. So what if? I inject my mock db into this task. And remember, this is a different test than my previous one, so there's no shared you know, side effects between them. And I just say, hey, mock db, persist. Assert you were called with nothing, right? I can just say, that's basically like assert you were called. Uh, it's going to blow up, and it's going to say, right, uh, I expected this call persist, but persist wasn't called. Because of course, nothing happened in this test. Uh, I just made the assertion. But that's what a failing assert called assertion looks like. Uh, if you call it with a different argument, so if I call persist with one, two, three, and I say assert called with nothing, it's going to say, right, uh, I expected persist to be called with nothing, but it was actually called with one, two, three. So that's super helpful, and that's exactly what you would expect an error message to show you. Uh, but uh, what if we have multiple, multiple calls? So we'll say persist one, and we'll say persist two, and then we'll say assert any call one. So that hopefully makes sense. It's an assertion. I'm saying, I don't care what order it happened in. Just tell me, did you, were you ever called with one? Uh, and that'll pass. The gotcha is, and this is why I wanted to show you assert any call. So by default, assert called with, not by default, this is the way it works. It only tracks the last call. I feel like this is sort of misnamed. Because to me, if you're like, hey, Mark, were you called with food? You know, to me, in plain English, that means, yeah, I was called with foo, I was also called with bar, different calls. But that's what assert any call is for. So assert called with only tracks the last call. I wish it was called assert last called with, because then there'd be no confusion. Um, so the corollary to that is if you called mock with bar, and then you said mock assert any call foo, it's just going to fail. The, the behavior, and this is a patch I'd like to write in my infinite time. I would like it to say, yeah, I know you said you, you expected to be called with foo, and that wasn't true, but I was called with bar. That would be super helpful, and it could totally do that for you, but it doesn't. So just a, a warning about that. Like, I remember when, when Rahul was here with me. Rahul and I figured that, and we were like, damn, 
we just lost half an hour because we were just expecting, because we came from Ruby, and in Ruby, a similar type assertion that would have said in the testing framework we're used to, right, you asked for foo, but it was actually called a bar. So we had a naive assumption that, of course, eh, you know, it's so good, why wouldn't it behave that way? It turns out it doesn't, so beware. Okay, studying return values. So here's a class called Weather Service. It's got a barometer. Uh, and let's pretend this is a real weather service class that goes out to the internet and does something. So we don't really want it doing this in our test because uh, it's unpredictable. We'd like our test to be deterministic. So maybe we have this forecaster class. I'm sorry for my contrived examples. So forecaster, you give it an instance of weather service, and then you say, hey, forecaster, forecast. And what he'll do is he'll call the weather service and he'll say, hey, what's the barometer at right now? And then he'll just, uh, he'll just look up in a dip, right? If the barometer says it's rising, then it's going to rain. And if it's falling, then it looks clear like it's not going to rain. Uh, and so that's, that's all this is doing. So let's test that. So we'll just get everything imported. And I will make a mock weather service, or you could call it uh, web service. I would never really name it mock WS. That's ambiguous. But otherwise, all my other examples down here don't fit on one line. So forgive the short name. Uh, so, mock weather service, mock WS is going to return a mock uh, of a thing that looks like a weather service. And so then here we can say, forecaster, right, in my test with my fixture, make me a forecaster using mock weather service. And then here we can say, okay, mock weather service, when somebody calls barometer, the return value should be rising. And then I will call forecast on my forecaster and see that it's going to rain. And do the same thing where when the barometer is falling, then it looks clear. So return value is the thing you can set on any mock, and when that mock gets called, it will put that in as its return value. So that's cool, but we can make this a little bit simpler, I think. Uh, and this is this parameterized thing I was telling you about before. So you can say, okay, I want to mark this test as parameterized, and I want to call it reading, and I want to say uh, expected forecast, when it's rising, it's going to rain, and when it's falling, it looks clear. And what that looks like here is, it's going to say, right, uh, I have this thing called reading and this thing called expected forecast, and those are going to be one, two, right? That's reading, that's expected forecast. So the you give it however many arguments you need in this in sort of tuple format, and it injects them in one at a time into your test, and it's perfect for this kind of case, right? Uh, you can combine all of your very similar tests when the only thing that's different between your tests is the input and the output in one really concise way. So I think that's pretty neat. Okay, monkey patching, the other thing I want to explain. So, mock has something called patch, and it's very similar to something that PyTest gives you called monkey patch. Uh, patching with mock is done typically through a context manager. Those are great, you should use them of course, but I find that I don't like the level of indentation that it gives me for the rest of my damn test when I'm just patching at the very beginning. So. When I can, I prefer to use PyTest monkey patch, which does a very similar thing. What it's going to do is it's going to go in there and let us mess with something. Because what if I can't mock uh, and inject it into my constructor for some reason? What if I've got the same class uh, called weather service, right? Uh, weather service has a barometer, but uh, let's say that right, he's done some pretty cool stuff. That's fine. But pretend my forecast is the same as before. Pretend my forecaster class doesn't take the weather service as an injectable parameter to its constructor. He just instantiates a new weather service because he imported weather service in his module. How do I test that? And that's where the monkey patching can come in. So monkey patch, uh, we say set adder, and it's going to go into a module, uh, whatever path you give it as a string, and it's going to set whatever value there you want. Uh, and it removes the patch from the function return. So it's only patching it for the duration of your, each of your test functions. So if we use it, it looks like this. Uh, so we pass in monkey patch. It's a fixture. It's just a fixture. There are a couple other fixtures I don't have time to talk about. The monkey patch is just a fixture in my test. So we've got monkey patch. We've got our mock WS from before, the same mock weather service. So here we go. This is where things get um, also a little bit tricky, because I'm going to say I have this big WS thing, which is a mock, uh, with, uh, a generic mock, where the return value is my mock weather service, right? So this is like the, the class, and this is like the instance of the class. Does that make sense? So that's why I used capitals for it too. So I can say, okay, monkey patch, I want you to set in the forecaster.weather service module namespace pathing. I don't know the right Python word, but 
go in there, and so when my, when my module runs, he's, you know, he's already imported his thing, but right, modules are just singletons in Python, so it's going to go, right, I'm going to go in there, and for the duration of this test, I'm going to take weather services value in that class, and instead make it this, this mock that when you instantiate it, I'm going to give back my mock web service instance. And then it's the same as before. I make my forecaster. I can't inject it in, but it was kind of already patched, and it behaves the same. Good? Cool. OK. Plugins. I want to sort of end with this. Uh, that's all the plugins for PyTest. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell you just about one of them, because that's all the time we have. My favorite. It's called PyTest IPDB. Uh, of course, we probably all like IPython. I learned to like it more than regular Python interactive shell. Uh, I, so, of course, there's PDB, and that's you're, you're probably all used to that. So, out of the box, pretend I hadn't told you about IPDB for a minute. Uh, out of the box, Python has a, a PyTest has a great feature. If you put dash dash PDB at the end of your invocation to for, to run PyTest, it will drop you into a debugger after each failure at the line that failed. So. It finds a failed assertion and stops right there in a, in a debugger so you can interactively explore things and figure out what was wrong with your assertion. Uh, then you know you can continue and it'll go on to the next one. That's kind of annoying because what if you have like 100 tests and you don't want to be like continue, 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 continue. So combine it with dash x. Dash x means PyTest stop after the first failure. So you mix those two things together and it's the first time I have a failure in my test suite, I want you to drop into a new debugger. When I'm done with that, we're done, right? Let me fix that test and then we'll, we'll repeat that cycle. That's super helpful because it just, I know it's like a little thing, but it saves you from having to go to your test and you know, import uh, IPDB and do IPDB set trace. This just does that for you. Super good. So that's what PyTest IPDB does, is instead of doing dash dash PDB, you can do dash dash IPDB, and it's the same thing except you get the IPython uh, that you know and love. So you just have to install it from this Git repo. And the neat thing is, that's all you do. So PyTest will look in your current Python environment, or virtual environment, right? And it'll say, what Python, uh, sorry, what PyTest plugins are installed? I found them, and I'm just going to use them. So there's no like going afterwards and configuring PyTest to teach it about all the plugins you installed. If they're there, if the eggs are there in your environment, PyTest will use it. And that's all I have. So do we have any questions? Bjorn. <laughs> About the parameterized fixture and that, do we have a lot for keyword arguments as well? You know, I don't know. Probably. I hope so. Yeah, I don't know. <coughs> you know I think the features, but I haven't used them. That's a good question. Any other questions? Um, you don't have to go back where you want the database versus, right? Yeah, yeah. sure. So back how, to that. how does it know, like, I, I, I guess database versus does not mean something to the point. Yeah, but if it weren't, if it weren't, uh, it's it's not going to return anything when I mock it. The mock goes in there and says, I am the implementation now, and the only thing I do is count how I was called and keep track of them. If you want me to return something, you uh, you better give me a return value. But mock also has a feature where you can say, call through. So that's also available. That's outside the scope of this talk. But you can tell mock also, actually, I want you to go ahead and do the call. Right. So this is this is why I thought that that would be a good example for for showing testing the database. Right. I like in my unit test. I don't want to touch the database. Yeah. So. I'm just saying this. If you don't return the correct value, it's just cause the right. Right. So typically, what you'll do is in your mock, you won't just say, "Here's here's the you know persist uh, is now a mock." You'd say persist is now a mock, and it returns true. Because all, all of my subsequent code expects persist to return true. Right? Because it's like, oh, the person succeeded, so I'm going to do the rest of my work. Anything else? Yes? Um, can you show one of the slides where, you, where we see the test getting a fixture? Yep. So there is a test getting a fixture. That's one. So you say it will search for a function called mockdb. Yes. So what if I want to. It's not just a function, it's a function that was also decorated. decorated. It has to be decorated. Yes. Yep. I want to reuse them across many test models, then I have to import them all the time? Or uh, conf test.py. So this bullet point here. If you don't want to import them all the time, 
and it's have to do all fixtures and do conf tests? You have two options. You, well, you either put them in conf test and well, PyTest picks them up automatically everywhere because they're super common and you want them there, or you put them inside, uh, you know, domain specific subset files and import them when needed. Okay. So it depends on what you're trying to do, but if they're super, super common, put them in conf test. That's what PyTest wants you to do. So we'll have one central conf test pipe yes. which imports my fixtures from other modules? You could do that if you wanted and to. I can use these fixture names in all my tests without importing them. I suspect that would work. Okay, sounds interesting. Okay, I think I should stop. I've been probably longer than I promised I would be. So, thank you, okay. Gabe. That's okay. me on Twitter, uh, and that's my email address. I'll end by just saying, like ThoughtWorks, I work for NEO. Uh, we're another agile consultancy here in Singapore. We are also always looking for talented people like yourself. So uh, if you'd like to know more about NEO, you can talk to myself or Michael, who also works there, or Rahul. Uh, Bjorn is contracting for us right now, so he could kind of have to tell you. <laughs> and uh, that's it. Thank you.